Please welcome Orbit Gray. Hi there. Thanks very much, Max. Uh, it's always great to come to the Alcor conferences and to speak to people who um, are so like-minded as myself with regard to doing something about ageing. And um, I will, by and large, restrict myself to relatively new information today because I know that most of you are already quite familiar with the basics of the work that I've been doing over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, but of course, I know that some of you will be more, um, uh, will, it, it'll, it'll be relatively new to you. So I'll start with a relatively brief introduction to the essence of the work that I do and the work that Sense Foundation does. Um, Sense Foundation is a charity. We are a 501c3 public charity based in California in Mountain View. And we are interested in developing treatments to postpone the ill health of old age. And in particular, we're focused on regenerative medicine solutions, and I'll be explaining what that means. I'm going to start by very briefly explaining what I mean by the term regenerative medicine. I'm sure you all have your own um, intuitive understanding of that, uh, but I want to make sure that we're all on exactly the same page. And the same for the word aging, which is subject to an awful lot of different definitions, some of which are more useful than others. So um, regenerative medicine, well, uh, of course, you know, you've all heard of stem cell therapy. That's obviously a major component of regenerative medicine. It's all about replacing cells that the body is not automatically replacing on its own by the division and differentiation of other cells. Um, you've probably, most of you, heard of tissue engineering, which is a sort of um, upscale version, if you like, a, high, a, a large scale version of stem cell therapy, where instead of injecting or otherwise introducing uh, disaggregated cells that will um, go to the place that they're needed and um, differentiate into the cells that are needed. Instead, we actually create an entire organ outside the body and then transplant it surgically into the body in the same way that one would make a transplant from some recently deceased person. Um, and in both of these areas, stem cell therapies and tissue engineering, um, insofar as they can be called two distinct areas, because of course they overlap enormously, um, both of these um, fields are really burgeoning. They're great. They're really, um, you know, that the, they are uh, the future of medicine in a big way. However, for our purposes, for the application of regenerative medicine for to aging, it's important to understand that there's more to regenerative medicine than that that in particular we need to think in terms of the possibility of molecular regenerative medicine, by which I mean rather than replacing whole organs or replacing cells and thereby repairing organs, we can actually repair cells. We can um, restore the internal structure of cells to how they were before they'd accumulated some kind of damage. Or for that matter, we can repair the material outside cells, the material that holds our cells together. And it turns out that all of those things are important when it comes to applying regenerative medicine to aging. Now, aging itself, as I mentioned a moment ago, is, um, you know, it can be defined in a lot of different ways. And it's important for our purposes to define it in a way that helps us to orient our thinking around how we might develop therapies against aging, therapies to postpone the ill health of old age. That's why I like this particular definition here. In this definition, what I'm saying is, first of all, something that is pretty obvious, but nevertheless has to be there in the definition, namely that aging is a side effect of being alive in the first place. Metabolism is the word that um, biologists tend to use to embrace, to encompass all the, um, the systemic and molecular and cellular processes that keep us going from one day to the next. You can think of it simply as the normal operation of the body. And pathology is the word that I'm going to use to denote all of the things that go wrong late in life, the diseases and disabilities of old age. So metabolism eventually causes pathology. You knew that, but it's got to be said. But there's an important thing in this definition on top of that that I'm saying. I'm introducing this word damage. And I'm going to be using this word damage in this very particular way as meaning the set of intermediates between metabolism and pathology the set of phenomena that are caused throughout life, even starting before we're born, as a side effect of metabolism, and that accumulate throughout life. 
therefore eventually reaching a level of abundance that exceeds the, what, what metabolism can tolerate. The reason why aging is basically not bad for you until middle age or later is because metabolism is set up to tolerate a certain amount of these slowly accumulating molecular and cellular changes that I'm calling damage. It's only when the damage accumulates to a higher level than that that metabolism starts to be impaired and the pathologies of old age start to emerge and progress. Now, um, a big question that may come up during the day is whether metabolism continues to create damage throughout life, even in really late life. Michael Rose, who actually, is there any news on Michael Rose? He's here, here marvellous. Okay, yes, he, he, um, he scared us by not turning up until this morning. Um, uh, it, it has been propounding for some years now the possibility that uh, the accumulation of the sort of damage that is conducive to an increased likelihood of death actually stops accumulating very late in life, and we'll hear more about that later on. Um, but I certainly think that the overwhelming balance of evidence is that damage does continue to accumulate in all individuals, however old they get. And, as I say, it eventually causes pathology. Um, so, what are the options for intervention? Oh, this is line wrapped in a way I didn't like. That's life. Um, so, uh, there are really... Here's one of the first reasons why this definition of ageing is useful. First of all, it helps us to distinguish between the two traditional schools of thought, lines of attack, that might be involved in combating ageing. I'm going to call those two approaches the gerontology approach and the geriatrics approach. So the geriatrics approach basically says, um, let's treat the diseases and disabilities of old age just like any other disease. Let's characterize and identify the symptoms and essentially attack them and try to behave as if we can eliminate the disease from the body. Now, that's all very well for an infection, but for something that's an intrinsic side effect of being alive in the first place, it's obviously ridiculous. It doesn't stop us from spending billions of dollars trying to do it, but the fact is, it's obviously ridiculous. All it is is patching up the symptoms of a problem that clearly is just going to carry on getting worse because the precursors, the causes of the problem, are continuing to accumulate. So the geriatric approach is better than nothing, but it's not much better than nothing, and it never ever will be. Even in principle, it cannot be much better than nothing. So that's, unfortunately, all we've got in terms of medicine for the diseases and disabilities of old age today. People have, of course, realised this. It's the, what I've just told you is by no means original with me. And for many decades, some people have been thinking, well, let's try and do something different. Let's try and adopt the mantra that prevention is better than cure and try and dive in at an earlier stage in the chain of events and, you know, clean up metabolism, slow down the rate at which it creates these various types of damage in the first place and thereby postpone the age at which, it, um, at which the damage becomes pathogenic. Great idea in principle. Unfortunately, geront the gerontology approach, as I'm calling it, has also been extremely un ineffective so far in combating and postponing the diseases of old age. Here is the main reason why. Metabolism is rather complicated. This is, as many of you will recognize, a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how the body actually works, about how metabolism works. And as you can see, it's fairly hairy, and it's pretty much inconceivable that we would be able to figure out a way of cleaning it up so that it substantially more slowly created damage without, at the same time, inducing unintended side effects that did more harm than good. It's basically just hopeless. The gerontology approach is by no means doomed in principle the way that the geriatrics approach is, but it is an idea whose time has emphatically not come. We just need to know an astronomical amount more. In fact, of course, I'm understating the problem. The real problem is not that this is a, you know, a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. The real problem is that this is a simplified diagram of a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works, which is, complete, which is completely dwarfed by the completely amazing, indescribable amount that we don't know about how metabolism works, even ignoring all the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. So, um, so, so, so you know, yeah, there you go. Um, but there's a third approach, which is the approach that Sense Foundation is following. 
And I like to call it the maintenance approach. It's essentially rather than trying to slow down the accumulation of damage or to patch up the symptoms of that accumulation, we actually repair the damage. We do preventative maintenance. That's what we want to do. Periodically go in and actually get rid of the damage. Not necessarily all of the damage, but enough of it so that we buy time, so that more damage has to accumulate before pathology emerges. And of course, we can do that repeatedly. This is how we successfully extend the longevity of simple man-made machines like cars or airplanes way beyond their warranty period. And it seems intuitive that we should also be able to extend the fully functioning, healthy longevity of a very complicated machine like the human body beyond its warranty period in the same way. So that's what we're trying to do. Rather than slowing down either the creation of damage or the creation of pathology, we separate those two processes from each other by periodically repairing damage. And I think it's got a great chance of working. It doesn't have the you know, the problems of the other two approaches. Plus also, of course, it might be good for people who have the misfortune to be in middle age already and who've already got lots of damage. If all you're doing is slowing down the further accumulation of damage, then you're not going to be rejuvenating people, and we'd like to rejuvenate people. So that's all pretty good news so far, but it's all just been terribly abstract and theoretical so far. I haven't actually told you anything that could make you believe that this is realistic. So now I'm going to do that. And the first piece of evidence that says that this is realistic is that we can describe what damage is in very concrete, biological, down-to-earth terms. This is, in my view, this is my claim, that all of the phenomena that can qualify as damage by the definition I'm using today, these intermediates between metabolism and pathology, are actually in one or another of these seven major categories. So you can see that these categories are, you know, proper biological phenomena. The first one is one I've already mentioned, loss of cells. This is what stem cell therapy is for, to actually replace cells that have died and not been automatically replaced by the division of other cells. In this short talk, I don't have time to go through this list in, uh, in detail, though I'll come back to a few of the items later on, and you'll see why we're optimistic about the um, treatments for them. However, the first thing I want to do is convince you that this is actually likely to be an exhaustive classification, that really everything that qualifies as damage is mentioned here. This is the first reason. It's been the same list for 30 years. No, it, it, all of the things I'm mentioning here have been major topics of study in gerontology since at least the early 1980s, and in many cases a lot longer. And, you know, if there were things to add to this list, we should really have found them by now. But that I know that's only a circumstantial argument. We can also give more straightforward biological arguments and ask ourselves whether the, um, uh, where the damage can accumulate, what types of damage could in principle accumulate. And ultimately, that's quite an easy thing to do because we can simply say, where are the long-lived structures in the body? Because a short-lived structure, whether it's a protein or a cell or whatever, if it's destroyed, then the damage that it may have accumulated is also destroyed. But here's the really good news. We have some idea how to fix all of these things. In fact, we have a pretty detailed idea. I've mentioned cell therapy already here at the top. This is the same list on the left-hand side that you saw a moment ago. And for each of these other six um, categories, we can also describe in a lot of detail how we might go about implementing a rejuvenation approach, a maintenance approach to um, addressing them. In, um, in each of these cases, we know enough that the book I wrote a few years ago, Ending Aging, that talked about all of this, had an entire chapter dedicated to each of these seven things. So, yeah, we know a lot. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment and talk and now get on to some things that you may not be so aware of. And some of the things I'm going to mention here are to do with new projects that we've just started funding. Um, of course, we are interested in implementing all seven of the various um, uh, therapies that I just um, tabulated on the previous slide. And, in fact, the only ones that we're not working on very much are the ones that other people are working on, and therefore we sort of don't need to. But there are three reasons why we don't restrict ourselves to this. And you probably know that we have sort of code names, sort of colloquial names for each of the sense um, components. Uh, we call them things like mitosense and lysosense. So this is metasense. This is the stuff that we do that doesn't really come under each of the seven any of the seven categories. First of all, I just mentioned that we have good confidence that the seven-point plan, the seven-category classification, is exhaustive. But that's not 100% confidence. And whenever there's any kind of uncertainty about that, we feel it's important to look into the possibility in detail. 
We've been funding a very uh, ambitious project at Albert Einstein College of Medicine for the past three years, looking at one particular component of ageing which um, some people think might actually need to be addressed in order to significantly postpone age-related ill health. It's the accumulation of what are called epimutations, the... Um, uh, like, like mutations, they are basically accidental changes to DNA, but in this case they're not changes to the sequence of the DNA, but rather to the what are called the decorations on DNA that determine which genes are turned into protein in a given cell and which ones are not. And that work has been extremely successful. We are actually, we just last week submitted a manuscript to Nature Biotechnology, a very high profile journal, um, demonstrating that we can now measure the level of epimutations in single cells, which is a, an improvement of over a thousand in the sensitivity of the techniques that existed previously. So that's an extremely good advance. Um, a topic that is going to be quite prominent in the next two talks will be whether sense is actually needed. In other words, whether we might have an alternative approach to combating and postponing the diseases of old age that is simpler to implement than sense is. And let's be clear, I'm not claiming that sense is simple. It's really pretty tough. Some people have for a long time felt that calorie restriction might be a very simple way of substantially postponing the diseases and ill health of old age. There is a lot of evidence these days that that may very well not be so, not for humans, um, that it may not work nearly so well for humans as it does for, um, uh, 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 for, for rodents. Uh, in particular, just a month or two ago, there was a report from the National Institute on Aging on a 25-year-long study of calorie restriction in monkeys, which essentially reported a negative result. And people are pretty um, uh, unhappy about that, of course. Um, uh, but we're actually funding a study which might illuminate some of this in a lab in Arkansas. Uh, we're interested in knowing, in, in understanding why the small nematode worm, Cinerabditis elegans, which is a major topic of study throughout biology, actually appears to be amenable to a greater degree of life extension using genetic manipulation than it is using environmental manipulation. I've hypothesized some years ago that that would never actually occur, that, it would, that anything that we can do with a simple modification of genes is also doable to the same degree by, the sort of by some sort of environmental manipulation that the individual would see in the wild. And we're exploring that. Uh, finally, I thought I'd just briefly mention that we're also interested in the consequences of successful implementation of sense, the consequences of society. Uh, you know, the demographic consequences, economic consequences, and so on. And we've just started funding a project in, at, at the University of Denver, uh, collaborating with an extremely prestigious group that have, have a forecasting system that's been developed over the past 30 years and is used by people like the Department of Defense and the European Union, very well-respected system. They are extending it so that it can analyze and explore the scenario of the elimination of age-related ill health. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some new work, and I'm going to start with work that is not done by Sense Foundation, but nevertheless is very relevant to, um, to, to, to the implementation of Sense. I mentioned earlier that um, stem cell therapies are things that we don't really work on very much, and this is because lots of other people do, and I'm sure many of you know that stem cell therapies in many cases are actually now at the level of clinical trials, so not anymore even experiments with mice in the lab, but actually experiments on human beings. Some of those clinical trials are relevant directly to aging. For example, there are clinical trials for stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease, which happens to be a particular aspect of aging that's particularly caused by loss of cells. Um, but also stem cell therapy trials that are not explicitly for age-related diseases are in many cases often also very illuminating and, and instructive with regard to um, what we would do against aging because what's learnt from those trials can be adapted for other applications. The thing I want to spend a little more time on is this one down here, molecular garbage that accumulates outside the cell. And there are various cases of this around the body that happen during aging. The one that is most um, characterized and uh, studied by a long distance is amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. 
which is composed of a particular protein named beta amyloid. And a lot of people have thought for a very long time that this particular stuff, this amyloid, is a big part of the, what drives Alzheimer's, what causes the progression of the disease. Now, about um, 13, 14 years ago, it was established in mice that if you vaccinate against this amyloid, this beta amyloid, you can actually get the immune system of the brain to engulf it. Cells in the brain called microglia will internalize this extracellular material, get it inside the cell, and it turns out that once that occurs, the material is quite readily destroyed because the machinery inside the cell is just better at destroying stuff than the machinery outside the cell is. Um, that was shifted to clinical trials ridiculously quickly, and actually the first clinical trial was um, abandoned because of side effects, because it was um, really not designed too well. But thereafter, um, things all started to come together, and trials uh, proceeded uh, using a modified technique, and phase three trials have been going for the past two or three years. Now, the superficially bad news is that the trials have just very recently reported, some of you may have known about this, and they have reported negatively. They have not um, reported a significant uh, achievement of clinical endpoints. But I want to make sure that you understand what this means and what it doesn't mean. The first thing is that the clinical endpoints were cognitive. They were trying to achieve an improvement in cognitive function as a result of the vaccination against this amyloid material. Now, the information we have, certainly from past experiments, I'm not sure whether the information on these particular trials is yet available, um, is that this vaccination protocol does remove amyloid. It does cause amyloid to go away. However, the accumulation of amyloid is by no means the only thing that goes wrong in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. In particular, there's another type of protein called tau, which accumulates in a different type of structure called a tangle inside neurons rather than outside. And vaccination against amyloid, lo and behold, doesn't get rid of tau. Nobody really knows the cause and effect relationships between the various things that go wrong during Alzheimer's. There's been enormous um, you know, fights about this over decades, and no, no real clarity has emerged. But what we do know is that when you've got a technological problem to solve that involves developing various components of the solution separately and putting them together, that you don't generally expect to see any actual efficacy until you've got all the components in place. Some years ago, when, I was, um, when SENSE was somewhat less respected within the gerontology community than it is now, a number of my colleagues suggested that the um, SENSE method, uh, approach couldn't work because none of the individual components of it had ever been shown to achieve any extension of longevity in, um, in any organism. And I pointed out that, you know, um, Henry Ford did not uh, actually warn his customers that the individual components of a car would remain obstinately stationary if you poured burning petrol on them, um, uh, and that you had to actually put them together to make the things work. Um, you know, a plane doesn't fly with its, if it's got wings and no engine, and it doesn't, not even slightly, right? And it doesn't fly if it's got an engine and no wings. Uh, so, yeah, we have no idea what's going to happen. So I'm very pleased that these trials have occurred and that we now know, therefore, that we have in our back pocket a seriously tested, effective technique for eliminating one component of Alzheimer's disease. And I believe that once therapies have been developed that can eliminate tangles as well, then it will be time to do a combination trial to put those therapies together and see whether we do have an effect. And we have absolutely no reason at this point for any kind of pessimism with regard to the results of those trials. Um, I want to say a little bit about a different part of this now, death-resistant cells. There are two ways, in the, the two categories of sense that, are, that revolve around having too many cells. There's having too many cells because they divide when they shouldn't, that's cancer of course, and there's having too many cells when they don't die when they should, which is something that's often ignored, but it's a very important component of some aspects of aging, especially immunosenescence. Now, several, several months ago now, maybe it's nearly a year ago, a paper came out, very fascinating paper, showing the importance of getting rid of such cells. Uh, essentially what happened was they created these, the, the researchers created these mice that had an accelerated accumulation of death-resistant cells, uh, which were um, characterized by overexpression of this particular gene up here, P16. Um, and these cells accumulated at a rapid rate, and sure enough, it was bad for the mice. These mice that you're seeing in this picture are only 10 months old, and the bottom mouse is not long for this world. It's going to die fairly soon. As you can see, it's not very happy. 
the researchers additionally modified these mice so that they could be given a simple drug that would not do anything to a normal genetically unmodified mouse, but this simple drug would simply immediately kill all the cells that were in this death-resistant state. And so they administered that drug relatively late in life to a bunch of these mice that had this acceleration of accumulation of these cells. And this is the result. The mice are perfectly healthy. They didn't get sick at all, really, until much later. And you know, there were a dozen different ways in which the researchers measured the biological age, so to speak, of these mice. This is just one example, the thickness of muscle fibers. And it was all really dramatic. <clears throat> I mean, of course, it's a very early stage result in a way. First of all, it's only in mice. Secondly, it's restoring the rate of aging of accelerated aging mice rather than extending the life of normal aging. And thirdly, it was only implementable by virtue of this genetic trick so that they could just give a simple drug. So it doesn't actually give us any clue how to develop a drug that will work in humans or in genetically unmodified mice for that matter. But despite all of those shortcomings, this was a sufficient boost to the credibility of the, so we say, the rejuvenation approach to combating aging, that the researchers were able to pull in a ridiculous amount of money, a high, high seven-digit sum, so I'm told, um, to, to, to form a company to actually find such drugs and, and take this forward commercially. So this is very good news, not only scientifically, but also um, in terms of the changing sentiment with regard to investment in this area. Um, for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about some work that we are doing at Sense Foundation. And it's going to be with regard to molecular garbage that accumulates inside the cell. Because we've made some very encouraging breakthroughs very recently over the past 12 months at most. Um, and some of that is um, published already, but only recently, and some of it's not yet published. So I'll talk about it. So we have an approach to, doing, to, to fixing this problem that's pretty interesting. Um, but first of all, I'm going to describe the problem. This is one example of the problem, and it's what happens in the early stages of cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease starts when white blood cells of a particular nature, they're called macrophages, go into the walls of our major arteries for the purpose of cleaning up detritus, just stuff that has got stuck there. And they're very good at it. Macrophages are really good at cleaning up detritus, at hoovering it up. A lot of that detritus is of the form of low-density lipoprotein particles. Now, that's a nice long polysyllabic thing. All it really means is chunks of cholesterol. There are, these particles are designed to carry cholesterol around the body in the bloodstream, and they're very good at it, but some of them get stuck in the artery walls. And macrophages clean them up, and they're very good at it, like I say. The problem is that cholesterol itself can be processed very effectively by macrophages, but occasionally cholesterol gets chemically modified. It gets oxidized into slightly different forms. And those oxidized forms, called oxysterols, are not well processed by macrophages. And they poison the macrophages. And the macrophage eventually turns into this bloated, sort of undead thing called a foam cell. Um, and, the, and what's happened is that this particular part of the cell, the lysosome, has become poisoned such that it can no longer even process normal cholesterol. And it starts sending out inflammatory signals, and more macrophages come in in an attempt to solve the problem, and they can't deal with this oxysterol either, so they become part of the problem, and that's how an atherosclerotic plaque emerges and grows. And of course, eventually, as all of you know, there's the danger that the plaque will burst, and, start, and, and um, chunks of this material start floating around in the circulation and get stuck in the coronary artery and give you a heart attack, or they get stuck in the brain and give you a stroke. And as we all know, this is the number one cause of death in the Western world. So what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, let me just go to this one because it's easy to explain. What we're going to do about it is exploit the ingenuity of evolution as seen in other species, in particular as seen in bacteria. So what I'm just trying to characterize with this little cartoon, thank you, is that there's a process that turns young people into, dead pe into old people and eventually into dead people. Um, and then there's a completely separate process, not encoded in our genome at all, encoded in the environment, which turns dead people into decomposed people. Decomposed people consist of bones and teeth and basically nothing else. Everything else in the body, including these oxidized cholesterol molecules, is happily destroyed by the bacteria and other microbes that are in the environment. So our idea, well, my idea back in the late 90s, was to um, identify such bacteria that can break down particular substances 
and to figure out how they're doing it, figure out what genes and enzymes they're using, and introduce one or two genes and enzymes from those bacteria into our own cells so as to counteract the initial process that turned young people into old people in the first place. So the good news is it seems to work. This is a um, figure from a paper that we published a few years ago now, uh, actually the first paper published from work funded by Sense Foundation, and here we're showing that we can find bacteria that can break down this particular substance, 7-ketocholesterol, which is one of the various oxysterols. It turns out to be the one that's most important in terms of toxicity and abundance. Um, and what we're doing here is what's called an enrichment culture. We take, seven, in this particular experiment, seven different types of bacteria. Five of them don't know what to do with this stuff. They haven't got the genes to break it down, and so they just sit there like lemons and nothing happens. The other two, however, have a whale of a time, and after only 10 days, the material's all gone, and um, this is what we want. Next step, of course, is to find how they're doing it. We had various approaches to doing that. This is a mass spectrometry experiment identifying the breakdown products from which we can infer what enzymatic reaction has occurred, and then you can use bioinformatics to identify candidate genes. This worked for us. There are other ways that also worked for us to find the genes and enzymes that are involved. The next step, of course, is to put those enzymes into mammalian cells, initially only in cell culture, and that's what we've been doing over the past couple of years. So here we show simply that we can put these genes into mammalian cells and modify them in such a way that they go to the right part of the cell. The correct part of the cell, as I mentioned earlier, is the lysosome. And this on the left is a stain called acridine orange showing where the lysosomes are in a cell. This is a stain showing where our engineered gene is, protein is. And this, the fact that it's all yellow, the overlay, means that most of our, gene, most of our enzyme is going to the lysosome. So that's good. We've got to do more than that, though. We've got to make sure that the thing actually works. And there's plenty of reasons why an enzyme introduced into the lysosome might not work. But we have solved those problems. This is the most recent work in this area. This is from work that we've been funding at Rice University in Texas, published just very recently. And to cut a long story short, what it shows is that if you have a completely insupportable amount of this toxin, then the cells are overwhelmed whether or not they've got our enzyme and they die anyway. But if you've got more modest amounts, then the fact that the right-hand side, right-hand column of these histograms is taller than the others tells you that the cells are protected when they have this enzyme being expressed and being targeted to the right part of the cell. These various negative controls that don't do so well are cells that don't have the enzyme or they have the wrong enzyme or they have, an en they have the right enzyme but it's not appropriately targeted. So this is really very, very heartening. We're very happy that we've been able to do this. Um, we want to do the same thing in respect of other diseases and disabilities of old age that have to do with the um, accumulation of intracellular garbage. Uh, one of those is macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is the major cause of blindness in the elderly, and it's caused by the accumulation of fluorescent material over, uh, during life, which eventually gets to a point which kills the cells that it accumulates in. This is the particular substance that we need to hit. This is the shape of this molecule. It's a weird molecule that is not useful in nature, but it also can't be broken down by our cells. And we are trying to make sure that we can break it down. So here what we're seeing is a stain for the lysosome again, a different stain in this case, a protein called LAMP2. Um, and the first thing we need to be able to do is create cells in cell culture that express LAMP2. Uh, that the, the, the express LAMP2 and also have A2E, this substance, in the lysosomes. Uh, the way we do this is actually very similar to what I was telling you about amyloid earlier. We put it into the medium and we get the cells to engulf it. We get the cells to internalize it. That gets it into the lysosomes, as shown by this overlay here, the fact that the A2E and the lysosomal, target, lysosomal marker are overlaid and you see yellow. The great news is that we found enzymes that can do the right thing. In the top row, we just see A2E that's been taken up by cells, and because there's no enzyme, we don't see anything else. Down here, we see we've added this enzyme. We've got less, much less of this green stain showing A2E. We've just got these occasional spots of it. Here's our enzyme. And if you look here, you don't see an overlay. You can probably see very um, slightly one or two spots of green, and they're green, they're not yellow. So this indicates... Um, the occasional lysosome that the enzyme hasn't got to, and sure enough, the material hasn't gone away. So we're not quite so far along here as we are with the, with the oxysterols. We haven't shown viability of cells yet, but we're getting there. So just last slide, this is um, what we've got to do still. We've got to move into mice, but I've told you about steps one through four of this, so we're pretty happy. We'll probably be moving into mice in both of these models in the next year or two. 
Um, this is the book I mentioned earlier that I um, wrote about with Michael Ray about five years ago. I'm pleased to say that it's still pretty up to date, not in the sense that nothing's happened at all, but rather in the sense that the progress that has been made has been very much the progress that we anticipated. It's not going fast enough, I assure you of that. I, we, we, we estimate that if we could take our current budget of about $4 million a year and increase it by an order of magnitude, then we would probably be moving forward our research about three times faster. But I do think that we are moving as fast as I would have predicted 10 years ago that we would with the money we do have. So we have very good reason to believe that we're on a good track and that we have demonstrated our robustness. So anyone who wants to uh, con contribute to accelerating that, you're very welcome to do so. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.